Hey there, this is James Darknell from The Foundry, and in this episode of Moto In-Depth, I'm going to be going over the texture locator. Now, I talked about this in the last video for the image map, and the reason for that is all textures, procedural, bitmap, or otherwise, all have an associated texture locator. And that is because the texture locator defines how a 2D image or a flat image maps onto a 3D surface. So all of the settings of the texture locator control the look of your texture map over the surface. All right, so let's take a look at the texture locator. So I'm going to add one here. So I have my teapot. Uh, actually going to assign a surface here. So I'm going to hit M, uh, give it a name teapot, and press OK. So we have a teapot material now. So we can adjust this. Yep. It's working the way we want. So we're going to add an image map. So we go here to the image map and load an image. And I think I'm going to go with the koala here just so as it'll be very obvious what we're mapping for. Okay, so this is the image map that we were talking about last week. And if you twirl down this little plus guy right here, you can see this is the texture locator element here. And to get to that, whenever you have an image map selected, generally they both select at the same time. You can go to the texture locator. And these are all of your settings for your texture locator. And it seems like a lot, but there's really just a few that you really have to pay attention to. And I should also point out that the texture locator is the only item that actually exists in the items list. So whenever you add a texture, you're going to get this texture group and all of your textures appear in here. Uh, if you're getting a texture group and you're not seeing something in here, I think by mo default, Moto filters out the texture locator. So you can just click the little dialog box here if you're in 10.2 or 10 series, and then you can turn on the texture locators and be able to see them. But a lot of people see the little results of the texture locator outlines in the viewport and don't quite understand what they're for. So they just feel that they're visual noise, so they disable them. And by putting them in a folder like this, they're real easy to just disable all of them at once, so they're not getting in your way. So that's actually a good workflow for when you're working with texture locators because they're super handy when you need them and when you don't need them, they're just extra stuff on the screen. So you can just toggle that off. Okay, so we're back at the texture locator. So I just want to point out that the most important setting of the texture locator is the projection type. Now this projection type controls the basis for how the texture is projected onto the surface. So you can see here, there's a lot of procedural ones, sort of solid, planar, cylindrical, uh, and then it usually defaults to UV map if there's a UV map present on your target mesh. And that is a very controlled way of projecting the texture onto it. And then we also have a couple extras down here at the bottom. So if you're ever confused about what these different types mean or what they're doing, if you open up the documentation here, there's actually images here in the documentation that illustrate to you exactly what each of the projection types are doing. So you can find this in the docs if you're ever looking for it. It's under the shading and lighting, shader tree items, texture locator, and then the projection type samples right here. Resize that window, kind of pops that panel back and forth. So we have the solid projection type. And really what this is, is it's like a solid from what your object is made from. And it's almost like it was carved away from that surface. So wherever the intersection of the texture and the surface of your geometry intersect, that's how it's going to be shaded. So, and the projection types only apply to procedural textures like the, the noise and the couple of the other ones, certain ones like the checkerboard and weave, those are, are planar or can use the other procedural uh, projection types. They don't have a, a solid mode. So then we have planar, which is almost exactly like a movie projector where it just projects straight down onto your surface. We have cylindrical, which is a cylinder shape that projects inward uh, onto your surface. There's spherical, which is a sphere shape. Uh, and no matter, regardless of the size or aspect ratio or shape of your surface, it's always going to be stretched to the full definition of what you're applying your texture to. 
So that's one thing to note about the different projection types. And you can control that with these position, rotation, and size settings here. But say if you have a spherical, it's always going to be a full sphere regardless of the shape or everything. But it also depends greatly on how that projection projects onto the target surface because you might be using a spherical but the surface itself might not be a sphere so you can see like for cylindrical it's stretching here on that as it's projecting inward so for like the teapot the spherical makes more sense but when you're using like the planer you get a lot of stretching here down the side so that's just something to keep in mind as you're choosing a projection type so we have spherical and then there's cubic which projects all the way through and then at a certain angle the polygons switch to a different projection so that you have it basically at the 45 degree uh, relative to the surface itself cuts off to project the other texture so that way it gets less it gets less st stretching on your texture. Uh, and then if you're using something that has a logo or text on it, sometimes when it projects through the other side, it's going to be the mirror image in it. It's going to be correct on one side and the mirror image on the other. So then there's the box projection type, which projects from each axis inward toward your surface. So that way you don't have the issue with the, the reversing or the mirroring of the texture. And then there's also front projection, which is a camera projection, or you can also use it for lights. And this projects outward from the position of your camera or your light. And this stretches the texture to fill the entire frame. Uh, and then, of course, we have UV mapping, which is a whole other topic unto itself. But you can define very accurately exactly how the texture applies to the surface. Uh, and then light probe. This is mainly for environments. If you have shot one of those environments that looks like a chrome ball. This stretches out and undistorts that so that it looks like a complete surround. And then lastly, there's implicit UVs, which is for procedural elements such as fur, where you're not uh, strictly defining UV maps for it, but there's one that's uh, generated automatically. And then you can use the implicit UV method to map textures onto those fur or onto those fur fibers or whatever it is that it is and you end up generating that has the implicit UVs. So we can kind of look here. So if we go to the, the solid, or excuse me, to the, the planer here, and we make sure that our texture group is enabled, you can see here this is the little indicator that we get in the viewport. So if we're in items mode, you can only directly edit a texture locator in items mode. You can see we can move this guy around and that is defining how that surface is being mapped as we move that. So we can scale that to see exactly what that's doing. And as you see, these values here are changing as we're doing that. So we're actually changing the item. So if I increase the size of that texture locator again so that we can see it very plainly, you can see of the different projection types that we choose that it's going to change the that representation in the viewport. So cylindrical, spherical, cubic. So you really only get them for the spherical, cylindrical, and the planar. And depending on which projection axis you grab, and this is all defined by the size value here. So if we just hit one in that, you're gonna see that's gonna to jump to one. So you can either numerically enter the values right here. And this rectangle here basically represents the scale in space of this is the actual size relative to our surface that the texture is being projected on. So this is being projected on a as a square so if we have, say, a different aspect ratio, we'll definitely need to stretch that texture out so that it will remain unstretched when it's applied to the surface. Now, one of the things that, now that you understand what a projection type is, one of the things that's really important to understand about texture locators is they apply their texture to the surface based on its location relative to the origin. So let me explain what that means.
So if you've applied your texture locator here and we're in our teapot and we take this and we go into polygons mode and we move our teapot, you can see it looks as though the surface is swimming over the top of our teapot as we move that. And that's because we're actually moving the geometry itself relative to that texture locator, which has defined the positioning of that surface. However, if we're in items mode, we're actually moving, grab the teapot, we're actually moving the entire teapot. And in that case, we're moving the center point of the item and moving that center point keeps that texture associated to that. So as you see, we can still move the texture locator here and that's changing it. So like I said, that's because it's relative to the item's position or how the item is relative to the origin or its center location. So we, if you ever need to figure that out, we can temporarily return an any item that's moved away from the origin in items mode just by clicking this little little checkbox here. But you have to be sort of careful because if you're trying to do this manually or visually, I should say, and you're moving this guy over here, you're gonna say, why am I not getting the results that I want when I'm putting my texture right here over the top of my teapot? And that's because it's been moved away from the origin. So really it's best to just keep your objects at the origin, do your texturing there before you do any animation, before you do any uh, moving it away or layout of your scene file. Okay, so the next setting here is auto size. And what the auto size does is the surface tag or whatever surface you have on your object, it automatically sizes these size values uh, and the position value if necessary to the bounding box volume of the the surface definition so if i hit auto size right here you can see it has stretched my texture locator projection so that it's exactly the width and the height now if i were to change that projection you see that it's also mapping that because this size value right here uh, and these position values are telling it that's for each projection, that's what the size is. So for the X plane, you're gonna get an X, Y value. So this is X and the Y values on there. So if we were to do something, say, go into polygons mode, and just I'm just gonna quickly assign a material here, teapot loop, uh, go into the shading tree, and then if we were to quickly move this texture right here, and then if we go to auto size, you see now it has scaled the texture locator to be automatic or to the, the volume size of just that selection. So I'm going to undo that, move that back down here. And we can just delete out that selection and then reassign the original teapot tag to this to bring that back into where it was. Okay, so now we have covered the projection type and auto size. Now the world transform is on by default and I don't know of any time that anyone has actually found this useful, but the, uh, the world transform, as I was saying that if you're moving items, let's say you had for some reason taken your texture locator and parented to your object. And I think we actually need to open up a render window here. Let me position this over here for you. Okay, so we have the teapot and the texture locator is parented to that. So now if we take the teapot and we move that teapot Oh, we're moving it up. Need to move it in items mode. Okay, so we have the teapot and we're moving that teapot. You can see it looks like the texture is kind of swimming around that. It's because you're moving the texture locator as you're moving the object because obviously because they're parented together. And since the texture locator is assigned relative to the origin, 
of an object by parenting it you're basically moving the texture locator away from the origin so what the world transform is supposed to do is if you disable that and then we move that teapot you can see now it's no longer swimming around because of that setting so basically then it ignores the transforms of the texture locator itself and I honestly don't know anyone who's ever used that specifically but it's there if you need it okay and then there's also let me undo this parenting nonsense all right so we back to where we need to be nope undo undo all right so we're back unparented so it, it's just the it's just the texture locator by itself okay so now go to the teapot now the next setting underneath that is world coordinates and then now we aren't we're moving only the teapot and you can see in some instances like i said i think we need to see a preview on this if we have world coordinates enabled now when we move the item you'll see the texture stays still and the object moves so it's just a way of decoupling those two moving together the world coordinates and the only time i've ever had a use for world coordinates is if you're texturing and you have a bunch of objects that you're moving around uh, it's nice to get subtle variations in the surfaces they won't all be identical if you turn on world coordinates so let me if i were to instance this guy uh, go to the item list here teapot and duplicate set instance and then we move the instance so you see these both have even though they're instances of each other because i have world coordinates uh, they both have different texturing on it obviously this is only going to work if you're using something like a, a tiling brick texture or some sort of a procedural texture uh, those are when that setting is most useful but that is what the world coordinate setting is and when you do use it that is actually very useful delete that guy close that window now let's go to the next settings so we've already gone through the projection types because those are the most important ones uh, but there's a couple different settings here uh, the if you happen to choose say the front projection then that's going to ask you what you want to project from so it'll give you a list of all the cameras and the lights so if you have a camera there obviously when you're just in a regular viewport you're not going to see the texture change but if you go to a camera point of view and then animate your object moving around now uh, that probably needs a oh see there you go it's updating as you move it around so that's definitely projecting from the front camera And then if you ever, you know, obviously probably familiar with this, if you select UV map, uh, then you can set the, the UV map here from the UV map setting itself. And the front culling, uh, what this has done is if you're using the projection, uh, the front culling, what that does is it only projects the texture on the front of the surface and it culls the, basically removes the texture from any back faces so you don't get that mirror image. Uh, this is useful if you want to use a specific camera to project a texture say for instance your camera matching and you're using a camera to project a texture onto a surface and then you're actually animating through the scene using a different camera you can use the front culling uh, so that that texture isn't projected through the surface creating a weird backdrop or a, a backside image to those surfaces this next option use clip udim udim is a method to utilize more than the zero one uv space so if you have the use clip udim it automatically lets you specify udim positions across the uv space 
using the naming of the texture. So I'm, this is just one option right here. It's actually a, a much larger function uh, using UDIMS that I'm not going to go into uh, descriptions here in this video. But if you want to learn more about it, you can uh, do a search here in the documentation for the UDIM workflow. Uh, and this explains how you have the, the typical zero to one space, and then you can use these areas outside that. And then you can also use different resolution textures. So say if you have a hand at 512, uh, but you want to have the face at 1024, something like that. So it basically lets you control your textile density, your texture resolution on your image uh, in a more meaningful way rather than just putting everything in one UV map. So if we disable that, uh, you use these offsets to offset, but since we're not using a UV map here, so if I were to set this down to UV map here, we would get these offsets and that would offset the, the UV map positioning. Alternatively, than the automated way of using the clip U dim. But the cool thing about the U tile offset and the V tile offset, it's also a you can animate this value. So it allows you to animate UV textures, or if you're using procedural textures or a tiling texture, something like that, it get, allows you to get an animated effect of those textures sliding across the surface if that's a, a look you are going for. So, and these are all sort of grouped together here because they all relate to the UV map. So say like the, if you're using the UV map here, the horizontal wrap, this will scale your UV automatically without having to actual scale the UVs themselves. So say if you wanted the image to go four times across the texture rather than just once uh, for the horizontal direction, or, you know, it could do four as well. So it's a, an easy way to make adjustments to your UV mapping uh, of your surface without having to modify the UV map itself. Now the repeat options control on a UV map what happens at the edges of an image outside of it. And then actually this happens with all of our projections. So if I go here and I set that to planar, and I move this guy down so you can see, and we don't want to wrap that guy. That's interesting that it still reads these wrap settings even though we're not using a UV map. I wonder if that's a display bug or a feature. Okay, let's put this back to one. On that, go back to planar. I wanted to show you this repeat option. So right now it just repeats the texture over and over outside of the bounding area of the specified texture locator. But we can also set that to reset, which basically turns the texture off. So if we set those both to reset, you can see as we scale that down, it resets and then we can also have it mirror so it bounces back and forth so if you have a texture that's close to tiling but it doesn't quite tile sometimes you can get away with using a mirror on that to make a tiling texture and then the the last one edge this just outward clones whatever the outside edge one pixel is and this is actually great for transparent images if your image is transparent around the outside, you can set it to edge and it'll just retain that transparency uh, for your texture outward across the surface. So you just have the, the opaque areas of the texture showing. And then we can, of course, rotate the UV. You know, that's the projection here, but if we were UV mapped. So let's try rotating that. Maybe that only shows up in the render here. Yeah, so that is a render only effect here. So you can see it's rotating that as I rotate that around. 
Now this next option here, random texture offset. Now this is a cool little feature that's probably not very well known. So I'm gonna need to make a, a few little instances of my teapot here. So why don't I just go into items mode here and I'm gonna go to duplicate and we're gonna create a quick little array. Not that many though. One, three, four. All right, so that's gonna create an array there. And then we'll open up a preview window with F8. So we can check all of this out. So hopefully I can make this obvious enough. So we're gonna go back to one on our horizontal wrap. So we wanna set our random texture offset to surfaces in this case. You can see there's several different options where we have particles and replicas for replicators, mesh parts for when you're using different parts of a mesh, or surfaces for when you're using different items. Uh, and then we this works hand in hand with this texture offset amplitude, and then we would increase this value. And you can see for, even though we're using a UV map, it's randomly adjusting these tile offset values per surface now so that it offsets those so you can get some nice variation in your texture so it's just an additional nice little way to to create variations in your surfaces and that's built right into your texture locator without having to do layer effects or anything else like that and uh, lastly the tangent vector type uh, this defines the tangent vector for calculating normal maps. So if you've UV mapped a normal map, depending on the way that the normal map was generated, you would use either the cross product or the DPDU, DPDV type of tangent vector basis. So that is everything for the UV maps. Try and wrap this up a little bit faster here. All right, so now I think this next effect is the falloffs and the texture replicator. So let me think the fall off will be a little bit easier if we do this on a plane. So let me create a new plane item and we'll give that the material of the teapot. That puts our little koala guy on there. We'll open up a preview window here. Turn off our teapot. All right, let's go back to our texture locator now. We have that set up to one. Set this to planar on Y. And we're going to auto size that guy. And we're gonna turn off our rotation here. All right. Now the fall off basically just allows you to fade out uh, your texture from the position of the texture locator. Uh, and that is the texture locator center point, which obviously in this case is at the origin. So if we fall this off as cubic, you can see we can start increasing the fall off in the X. And the higher that value goes, the stronger the fall off is. Honestly, I think the fall off option is kind of useless. So I don't recommend ever using it. You get much better results, more controllable results using a gradient or using an alpha mask. Okay, so now that we've gotten past that, there are several different types of falloffs here that you can use if you decide to use this feature. Uh, and then you can control it per axis with the falloff value. And changing that value, increasing that value, controls the, the strength of that falloff. But beyond that, you really don't get much control of the falloff itself. So generally, you would just leave all of those values at zero and we'll move on to the next topic.
This next option, the texture replicator, this is the equivalent of a replicator, but where a replicator works with geometry to a point source, this works with applying textures to a point source. And I think I'll better explain it if I have a custom setup. So give me a second here. I'm going to pause the video and I will come back and we'll finish off all of the settings of the texture replicator. Okay, so I set the texture replicator up here, or I have the surface here. It's just I turned on my plane and subdivided a few to get me a few more vertices across the surface so that I can illustrate this to you. So if we have the plane, we're going to go into the shading and grab that texture locator again and look at its properties. So what this does is, like a replicator, you take a particle source and you can say the plane for instance and it places the texture at each vertex of that point source and then you can control the size of that so in this case we have them kind of small and that size includes these fall off so you have your fall off gain which is the how hard the edge is for your fall off uh, and then you have your bias where that's inside or outside so we have that at 100 and we have our gain at 100 I guess we want the bias at 0 in that case that gives us exactly what our texture is and I should point out that if you're using a texture replicator specifically it always is going to default to working with squares so if you have a texture that is not square uh, you're going to want to make the canvas size square and just make it transparent at the areas. So the texture itself, the bounding box, would be square, even if the image inside of it is rectangular. So in this case, you can see that is specifically making that uh, a square in here. So the fall off gain and bias control the, the fading around your edge. And why that is useful, I will show you in a second, is you can increase your size here. And say if this was a grass texture, then we can go in here to the random size and give this some random sizing on there and some random rotation. Oops, I hit the random rotation value is what I want. So now you could see how a grass texture would blend those edges together. And even though it would be a small texture, uh, you would look like it was more texture than it was. So let me go in and replace this really quick. Use the replace image option. Replace as still. So we'll just go this chrysanthemum image now. And you can see how you get more of a tiling sort of a look to that. So if I were to increase that size a little bit more. See how it kind of gives you an interesting texture to that without being obviously repeating. So all of these settings here basically just control these textures once you're on here. And there's some additional things you can do with uh, texture, uh, texture replicators as well. So for instance, you don't necessarily have to use the ordered plane uh, uh, textures, or excuse me, you don't have to use the ordered points of the surface that is applied to you can specify something else so i created a, another layer here that was just spraying out some random points so if i go in there and i specify that as my particle sport you can see it just goes around where those points are you could also add a like a surface generator uh any sort or you can even use another piece of geometry in your scene Okay, now before I wrap up this video, I have one cool little trick that I want to show you, just a little tip here. 
which is really one of the nice benefits of the, the texture locator. Let me make sure this guy is at its origin when I do this. So since you can manually control the texture locator as an item, you can actually place it directly on items very accurately. So I like to do, you can do this in the setup tab. And we'll jump to our advanced viewport here. Now we have these drop actions, and if you use the place and align action here on your texture locator, you can actually align that directly to a surface. And you can see now that it projects right where you drag that to. So if I were to drag that onto the ground, it'd be flat. Drag that to the side of the teapot, it projects that onto the teapot. So you can see how powerful that would be if you were using the, if you were using it and you had the, the texture set to reset. So you're just projecting that outward onto that surface. And we can scale that down. Trying to see which handle I want. I think if we get a local mode there, we can see that's the handle I need right there. So you can very accurately place labels and stickers and that sort of stuff on a surface. So I think that is one of the coolest features of being able to use the texture locators. And obviously when you're done with them and you don't need them anymore, you just disable that and you don't see that little indicator anymore in your scene and you can take your objects and you can animate them around and your textures will stick right to your surface. So thank you for watching this video of Moto In-Depth for Texture Locators and uh, we'll see you next time.